There we go. So we're just going to wait a couple more minutes for everybody to get signed on. And then we'll start probably right at um, seven o'clock French time. And if you're on the East Coast, around one o'clock. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. Just about five more minutes and then we'll get started. Just a couple more minutes. Um, I hope you can all hear me and my microphone and everything is working correctly. Let me see if I can find the chat. There's the chat. Okay.
just gonna wait about one more minute and then we'll get started. So let's get started. Um, so welcome everybody. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our presentation today. I know things are quite different these days. I'm sure everybody is busy managing kids' uh, schoolwork, education, their daily routines, and keeping them active and engaged. Um, so I know your time is precious, so let's get right to it. Um, and I'm going to ask you because I have a habit of talking pretty quick. So if I'm going too fast, just uh, shoot a message. Um, for me to slow down and I will do my best to do that. And now let me see. Okay, so who am I? I'm a pediatric occupational therapist. I'm from New York. I'm currently living in France. I work with all kids, um, all different ages with all different um, diagnoses from children on the autism spectrum to kids with learning disabilities, um, physical difficulties, genetic disorders, and various sensory processing issues. Um, I love working with children on the autism spectrum, and since it's Autism Awareness Month, um, today's presentation is going to focus on this particular population of children. Um, so my examples are going to all be around autism and um, children with this um, diagnosis. A few of the tools that I use in my work with children on the autism spectrum are sensory integration techniques, floor time, um, and I do use a lot of auditory interventions, in particular sensory, which is what we're here to learn about today. So very briefly, Soundsory is a 40-day music and movement program. It consists of about 30 minutes, less than 30 minutes of listening per day. Um, and we'll get into all the specifics of that in just a minute. So what I'm gonna do right now um, is just talk a little bit about children, um, all children, all children, including children on the autism spectrum are all individual and unique, um, yet they can have similarities and similar characteristics. Um, and for children on the autism spectrum, they can have similarities in the different areas that are impacted for them. So I'm gonna focus on four areas that are often impacted for individuals with autism um, and explain how these, explain what these areas are and explain how sensory can have an impact on these areas. So the four areas that I'm gonna focus on today are social communication, um, having restricted or, restricted or repetitive behaviors, um, the area of sensory motor and sensory processing. And children without an, autism diagnosis can also have difficulties in any one of these areas, um, but our focus today is really children on the spectrum. So the first area um, that is often impacted is social communication. So what does that mean? There's so many things that are involved in social communication. You have nonverbal skills, facial expressions, um, sustaining and maintaining eye contact with others, knowing how close to stand to somebody, uh, using gestures when communicating um, verbally, uh, being able to communicate, being able to use your words, um, modulate your tone of voice, know how loud to talk, how soft to talk, um, turn taking when you're talking with somebody else, knowing when to listen, when to talk again. Um, these are all things that can be impacted and are all involved in social communication. Um, the next year area is these restricted and repetitive behavior. So children on the spectrum can have this. They can have different types of stereotypes. I've worked with many kids who have had um, a super strong interest in like opening and closing of doors. Um, kids who like to kind of lie down and watch the wheels on the train or the car move. Um, kids who line things up. Um, I've observed um, when kids are super excited, uh, some arm flapping and other stereotype behaviors like that. Um, they can also have a specific, you know, narrow focus of interest, you know, knowing everything there is about dinosaurs and only talking about dinosaurs. Um, I've worked with kids who have had a strong interest in, you know, letters and numbers which makes them distracted for other types of communication. Another area that is often involved is the area of sensory processing. So being super sensitive to touch. So only liking to wear one set of um, his favorite t-shirt or one pair of shorts that are super soft, um, have been really worn in, or maybe they don't like getting messy or using the school, school materials. 
Um, they can seek a lot of visual input, or maybe when, that's, when their environment is too visually stimulating, they tend to avoid it. Um, they might have sensitivities to taste and smells, um, tend to be pickier eaters, prefer only certain amounts of food. Um, they can be sensitive to movement um, or avoid movement or be always on the move. So lots of different areas um, in sensory processing that can be impacted. In addition, we also have motor skills that are often, um, often involved. So kids can have, uh, with autism, can have low muscle tone, coordination difficulties, um, difficulty pointing to things to get the attention of somebody else, digger, difficulty figuring out new motor skills, jumping, skipping, hopping, running, things like that. Um, always moving or not moving enough. Um, and I know this list can go on and on, and I'm sure I haven't covered um, everything, but I just want to, you to kind of keep these four areas in mind. So social communication, restrictive and repetitive behaviors, sensory processing and sensory motor, because these are the areas that you can experience um, change in following the sensory program. So what I'm gonna talk about um, is, I'm gonna kind of start at the end and what changes you can expect to see it with the program. And I think it's a good idea to start here because this is what most families want to hear. You as parents want to know with any new thing you, that you try, such as sensory, what is going to change? What changes can I expect to see with sensory and how does it work? Um, this list right here is just all the things that I've seen in clients that I have um, directly worked with and who have completed the sensory program. And again, every child is different, the rate of change is different, their goals are different, their focus for using the program is different too. Um, and I'm going to give you a case example which I think will help illus best illustrate this. So this is a picture of an adorable little boy, um, Cammy. he's five, he has a diagnosis of autism. Uh, the woman in the picture is his one-to-one -one aide who um, would come weekly for OT sessions with me. We, in our sessions, we would use a lot of sensory integration techniques, floor time, sensory motor activities. Um, his aide was always there to either participate or observe um, and learn different strategies and tips for working with um, Cammy. And this is kind of like what he looked like in our session. So he, in the area of social communication, was definitely language delayed, um, not a lot of spontaneous language. He did have some words and with prompting, he was able to um, use them and access them, but it would take a lot of prompting, a lot of cueing, a lot of reminding for him to use his words. If he was super highly motivated for routine things like a particular food or something like that, he could easily access his words. Um, he could sustain eye contact. Um, his eye contact was pretty good, but there were times if he was distracted by um, something in his environment that he would lose his visual contact. Um, he did have some repetitive behaviors. He definitely liked his routines. He had some um, visual hand movements that he would do, some scripting, um, a very strong interest in animal play and things like that. Uh, sensory processing that area, he was fearful of movement, sensitive to touch. Um, you know, overall presented with a more like defensive profile. Um, motorically, he was the low muscle tone, poor posture, poor endurance. Um, he would W sit, he would maybe engage in an activity or once or twice um, and then kind of just give up. And you can see him right here, he's kind of sitting on those cushions and he loved to do that. He would come in, just kind of plop and he wasn't the active um, moving about the, the about the gym. He would kind of seek a little corner and kind of stay sedentary and much more earthbound. And he completed the program. So he completed the 40-day program and the changes that this little boy made were just incredible. So he started to, um, after the first week, he started to uh, repeat words quickly. It took less prompting, less cueing. Um, his aide could just give him a visual cue and he was able to um, ask or demand what he wanted. And his, his length of phrases increased. So he was using two, three, four word sentences. Uh, he was initiating interaction, which he had never done with me before. He would come into the gym um, and seek me out. And he was much more teasing and playful. There was a much more give and take in communication. And this is what I hadn't seen in just our weekly OT sessions. Uh, motorically, he was showing better endurance, more confidence in movement. He would come into the gym. He would climb up um, onto this kind of, I don't know if you're familiar, but a bolster swing, so kind of like a hot dog swing. And previously, he would come up. I would coax him, you know, doing cartwheels to try and get him to try it once. And after the sensory program, he was climbing up six, seven, eight times before he would give up on it. He was just much more present. Um, and much more connected 
to, to the world around him. And there was lots of little great changes that happened following um, this program that he completed, which we'll talk again later on about um, this young little boy. So those are all the areas that can show change um, in your child with autism on the spectrum. Um, again, every child is different, how they progress is different, um, but these are some of the areas and things that you can look for change into, into. But now let's get dive into the specifics of the Sounds Free program. So what does it look like? How does it work? Um, pra practical tips on how to use it, some do's and don'ts of what you should do, what you can't do, um, and also the exercise, the movement portion of the program as well. So the great thing about sensory, Soundsory, excuse me, is that it is a home-based base program, meaning you could do the whole program at home. So the program is 40 days long. It's less than 30 minutes of listening per day. Um, and there's also an exercise program that goes along with it that does not involve any extra equipment. It's just your body. It is super easy to use. Um, everything is loaded right on your headset. Um, they're easy to use um, volume adjustment buttons, on the side, I don't know if you can see where I am, but everything is um, preloaded here. You're listening to the program through air conduction as well as through bone conduction here. And we'll talk about that in a moment as well. Um, and as a bonus, these headsets can be paired with any Bluetooth device. So you have more than one child in your family. Um, your other child wants to listen to their iPod or listen to their music or something like that. Um, they can just pair the device. And what happens when you are in Bluetooth mode is that the therapeutic portion of the program is turned off. Um, and the bone conduction piece is turned off. So you just have whatever music is playing on their device and we'll circle back to that in a little bit of a moment. Um, so things to remember uh, when you're using your sensory is the first and foremost, always charge it. Always make sure you have sufficiently charged the device. And I believe the device gets about eight to 10 hours um, before you'll have to charge it again. So there's a, um, at least two, four, six, eight, like eight, nine, 10 days before you'll have to charge it again. Um, the volume, it's really a good um, idea to always get in the habit of checking the volume. So every time you turn your headsets on or off, um, the volume is automatically readjusted to a volume of 10. So what I do is I turn this, the headsets on, I immediately adjust the volume down to five. I listen myself to make sure it sounds the same in both ears. I then put my ear on the top of the headset to make sure that the bone conduction um, sounds good and you hear music playing. Um, and then if I know that uh, the child I'm working with, excuse me, is more sensitive or more overwhelmed by auditory, I will maybe even drop the music a little bit lower, like four or three. Um, you always wanna make sure that when you do position the headsets that this piece underneath here, and I don't know if you can see, my camera is not in the best spot, um, is in contact with the head. So when you put them on, it has to be directly touching the head. And this is where the bone conduction piece is. So you can't put any like tissue or cloth in between the actual head and the headset. Um, I have had kids like, you know, will want to just kind of adjust it because it does kind of push a little bit once they've been listening for a, a period of time, but they, you could easily shift it back, shift it forward. And I haven't had a problem with that. Um, so now usually the next topic that comes up and often the probably the first question once you hear that sounds is an auditory program is how the heck am I going to get my child to wear headphones. They don't like hats, they don't like headbands, they don't like anything around their head. How am I gonna get them to wear these headsets? Um, I've been a therapist using auditory tools for a very long time and I haven't had um, any child that has not accepted the headsets. And I'm gonna try and give you as many tips and tricks that I can in this short amount of time that we have. Um, so if your child is older, generally cooperative, and for the most part follows a di um, directions, a visual schedule could be great here. Um, so that can be anything from a calendar that shows the 40 days, and maybe you put a sticker on the first day and the last day, or maybe you put a sticker ever after every day that the child has listened, um, or maybe they could write down the number so that they see the numbers that are getting bigger. Um, if the visual calendar is a little bit too complicated, um, maybe just have a visual timer during your actual listening session so that they know when the music start, starts and when the music is going to stop. Um, maybe a daily schedule, so um, pairing a fun preferred activity during or after the listening so that the child knows what to anticipate, what's coming, um, and what they can expect. Um, a good old fashioned bribe has never hurt anyone, you know, promising a small toy after a week or so of listening. Um, 
or however long you feel is appropriate for your child and what works for your family. Uh, maybe a bigger toy at the end of the 40 days or maybe a special treat after the first week or something like that. It's gonna really depend on what, um, what works for your child, what works for your family and what you're comfortable with. Um, using siblings as motivators. So having the sibling actually either listen to the program um, to demonstrate, or um, maybe they turn, turn the headsets to the Bluetooth mode that I talked about and they could pair their own music so they can pretend to be listening to the program while they're enjoying their own music that they prefer. Um, and reinforcers and distract, distractors, distractions are what I'm gonna talk about in a moment. Um, and those are really, um, can be really useful, really helpful, and are usually involved on a first or second day, depending on the child. So we're gonna go back to um, Cammy, our cute little boy, who I love, and he's sitting so nicely, he's wearing his headsets, looks so easy. Well, this is not how it started. Um, the first day I came in to put the headsets on, as soon as I came close to his face, it was, you know, shoulders up, arms up, like anything he could do to block the headsets from being worn. Um, his aide was with him the whole time and she knew, knew, knew what was reinforcing for him. So he loved to watch the show, um, Peter Rabbit. So what we did was the aide would turn the volume off, have on, the, on her phone the video playing. We would turn the video on, put the headsets on. And as long as he was watching the video and keeping the headsets on, the video stayed on. As soon as he flipped, which was often in the beginning, we would shut the video off and then replace the headsets, put the video on. So it was this kind of dance for the first day. And that um, each time he kept them on, the time got longer and longer and longer. And once he was, um, this was the second day, once he was um, accepting the headsets, we really wanted to transition him away from the screen. So we were using, you know, bubbles. And because I knew visual activities were his go-to, you know, we use those types of activities. So everything that was fun, reinforcing, motivating, and that's what you kind of want to do for the first day or two when you start the program um, has been my experience when working with kids, when working with all kids and especially kids on the autism spectrum is pairing all those fun activities. So he liked animals. We took out all the animal toys. We, you know, threw them, played with them, whatever we could to get him to just keep those headsets on the first um, few days. And he was off and running after that. So his aide completed the program, sometimes at school, sometimes at home. And the next week I saw him, actually it was two weeks, two weeks after I saw him, he came into the gym, had no problem accepting the headsets, and he would engage in activities. So the first few days, it was a lot more just, it was just enough to keep the auditory piece on, the sound series headset on. And then he came in those two weeks later and he was climbing on swings, he was engaging activities, he was just more open and, um, and tuned in, which was really nice. Um, so whenever I'm working with a kid, um, any child, uh, that's going to start an auditory program, the sensory, I typically go all in, meaning my expectation is for that 24, 25, 30 minutes, however long, um, I'm going to constantly be reminding the child that it's headphones on. So it's going to be a lot of repositioning headsets on. Um, and this usually typically only lasts the first day or two, and it depends on each child. Some kids come in, put the headsets on, and there's no issue at all. Other kids need a little bit more coaxing, a little bit more fun activities to get them to accept it. Um, I know other practitioners that will um, try or start off with like five minutes of listening, then the next day a little bit longer, and the next day a little bit longer. Um, so you have to know what is going to be the best approach that will work for your child. For me, it's you know, this is the rule, this is what's happening so that they know what to expect. They know when it starts and ends um, with visual timers and things like that. So that's kind of my approach um, for working with um, kids and getting them to accept the headsets. So once you get the headsets on, these are some things that you shouldn't do while you are listening. So you don't wanna have a lot of noise in the background. So you don't wanna have, you know, music playing or noisy games or, you know, somebody watching TV in the background. You don't want um, the child playing on the computer or on cell phones. However, I did in my example use um, a video device just to get the child to um, accept the headsets with my goal being to eventually take away as quickly as possible that visual reinforcer. So I would definitely use some of those visual reinforcers if it's super motivating and it helps um, your child to accept um, the headset with the goal of replacing that visual activity with an, uh, an alternative. 
So those are some of the things and eating. You don't want your child to be continuously eating or snacking or chewing gum. Um, so this might mean scheduling listening like either before or after a meal. Um, I have, you know, there's always modifications to the rule, um, used some small stacks initially, especially if that was what worked for the child I was working with. So like lollipops um, for my young kids, just to get them to um, accept the headset that first day or two. The do's, there's tons of things that you can do. So you can, um, and this list is huge, I mean, you can climb, you can play, uh, you can draw, write, create, build Legos. Um, what I, in my, um, in my working with kids on the spectrum, what I found is sometimes it's just enough to handle the auditory um, program itself. So oftentimes the first few days, the first um, three, four, five days, maybe you might see it's just enough to keep the headphone sets on. And they might just be really just kind of listening to the music and just sitting on the couch or sitting on the on the floor and just kind of taking it all in. They might not be as active. And that's um, kind of what happened to Cammy. So he was the little boy that I just talked about where in the beginning it was a lot of just, okay, headsets are on. I have my distractions. I'm playing with my little toys. And it was not a lot of movement in the first few days. And then once he got acclimated to everything. Then he was off, he was climbing, we were swinging, playing. Um, so it was a really nice uh, progression to watch um, and watch that change. So I hope that's clear. So yoga, um, I would say that anytime you're gonna do a little bit more of a physical um, movement or activities to put a headband on, um, your headsets, um, it comes, if you haven't purchased one already, it comes all in this nice little box. You have your headsets, I'm sorry, my camera is in a crazy spot. Um, headband um, for kids on the spectrum. Um, this has been my experience that sometimes these headbands are a little bit too tight. So you can buy any one of those um, soft um, headbands that girls sometimes wear um, that you can buy at like CVS or any one of the, the drug stores. Um, they're not that expensive. Um, or sometimes you get, um, I've worked with kids that as soon as you put the headband on, they flip everything off. So I'll just leave the headband. Um, headband off and if the headsets do slip or fall I'll just replace them on immediately. Um, so you have a lot of different options um, regarding that. So a few things that you just want to remember of course when you're using the program is just always make sure it's charged. Always check the volume because it does every time you turn it on or off set right back to 10 which is a little bit strong. Um, you always want to place the headset on the child with the right um, ear on the right side. Um, you want to keep an eye on your child to make sure that they haven't secretly taken off the headsets or are being um, too rough with the headsets. Um, you can follow the exercises um, online or you can create um, your own. You just want to kind of keep an eye on the clock, especially if you have a child that um, doesn't have as much, as much verbal skills to tell you when the program has stopped or if it's on or off. Um, what I usually find is that once the music stops, the child will then flip the headset. So that's a good cue that the music turned off or that the program has finished. So let's talk a little bit more about the actual um, technical aspects of the program. So what's in the headsets, what's happening in the program, and things like that. So, so what is your child listening to? So um, each day has about nine tracks of music per day with an additional 10th track that is designed to be paired um, with exercises. So if you look at my screen, you can see um, this little chart down, oops, chart down here. The left side of the box has um, a 0.1 after every day. So you 1.1, 2.1, 3.1, and then on the right side of the box, it's day 1.2. So every day that has a 0.1 after it is really the meat of the program. So those are the nine tracks of music. And then every day with a 0.2 is just one track, and that's designed to be paired with the exercise portion of the program. All the music consists of Bach, Hayden, um, Strauss, marches, uh, some children's songs, gospel, uh, jazz and Latin music and each song is approximately about two to three minutes long uh, long enough for the brain to get used to the rhythm of it but short enough to avoid that kind of habitual processing so how they are listening so when your child is following the program they're always listening to the music through both bone conduction and air conduction when the headsets as I said earlier are off um, and in 
when the headsets are in Bluetooth mode, the program is off, so they're not listening to the music part of the program, and the bone connection is off as well. So it just becomes a, a really nice pair of regular headsets. And why do we want both these types of listening, air connection and bone conduction? Well, sounds transmitted through vibration, so bone conduction, are 10 times faster than air conduction. And they go directly to the inner part of the ear, the vestibular part of the ear. So the part that is focused on all things that are related to motor. And this is a motor and movement program. So because it is faster, it kind of acts as a, as a preparation for the ears to receive the sound coming in via air conduction. So what do children on the autism spectrum often benefit from? is this preparation, extra time to kind of receive either verbal directions or a schedule change or anything like that. So this is really important for kids on the autism spectrum who do have difficulty with auditory information and get overwhelmed when there's a lot of auditory information coming at them. It's a way to kind of prep their system and give them time to be prepared for the sound coming in. In addition, there's also a dynamic filter that is on the sound-free device. So the dynamic filter does two things. First, it surprises the brain. So when you listen to any track of the program, you will hear moments where the music sounds brighter, crisper, um, and moments when it's less. So there's this perceptual contrast within the music. And why do you want this? Well, when you surprise the brain, you make the brain more attentive to what is happening. So, um, and attention is very reward oriented. So in addition to, um, in addition, you start to, to tap into those pre prediction mechanisms so that are often lacking in children with autism. So your brain starts to predict that the music is going to get brighter and crisper and it starts to pay attention to what's happening and it's rewarded when the music actually gets brighter and um, crisper. So another example of this is, um, I'm a knitter, I like to knit. So it's a passion of mine. So my brain makes the prediction that I'm going to make a dress for my new niece. So as a consequence of this prediction, I pay attention to what I'm knitting and I can focus on my project. And as a reward, I make a finished dress. So that's another way to kind of visualize this prediction reward um, mechanism. And in order to make change in the brain, we don't want the brain to tune out the music. We want it to anticipate and predict what is happening and then pay attention to it. So if we had music that was the same quality, eventually you could just learn to tune it out. Um, the second thing that the dynamic filter does is it makes the auditory muscles in your ear work more efficiently. So it, in a sense, creates a gymnastics of these ear muscles that get worked uh, to be better able to cope with aud and manage auditory stimulation. So what is often difficult for kids on the autism spectrum is processing and receiving auditory information. So being able to filter out noise, to tune into speech and language, um, in a sense, to have a good shock absorber for sound. So imagine driving on a bumpy road without a car that with a car that does not have a good shock absorber. So each bump that you hit is gonna be massively um, felt. Um, and that is just like children on the autism spectrum. Their ears are not shock absorbing sound. So they're either working on overdrive, so they're so sensitive, they're covering their ears, they're overloaded by all the auditory information, or they're work not working enough. So they're just in a sense kind of tuning out their whole world. You know, you can call them from another room and they're not responding to that sound of, um, speech and language. So this dynamic filter really helps exercise and regulate these muscles to work more efficiently. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Soundsory is a music and movement program. So we're going to talk now a little bit about the exercises that come along with the program. So I hope everybody is still with me and I'm not going too fast. Um, so the exercises can all be found online. So once you purchase Soundsory, you will be given a, um, a login code to see the video demonstrations of how to do each exercise. So if you remember earlier, the exercises are designed to be paired with that last, um, with the point two on every day. So you'll have day 1.1, nine tracks of music, then it'll shift to that last track, day 1.2, and you'll that's about a three minute long song, which will be paired with um, exercises. The exercises don't require any other equipment, just your body. So there'll be things like um, reflex integration, jumping exercises, balance exercises, pushing, pulling, um, left, right things, um, figure coordination, visual exercises. And I know some of you might be thinking like, there's no way my child is gonna follow these exercises. Um, and I can just speak to my own experience the program is not going to be, um, you're not going to lose the efficiency of the program if your child doesn't do the exercises as they are. Um, I'm going to use my example of Cami again. He didn't do one exercise. He listened to the first, you know, first part of the program 
Um, so every day that had a 0.1 after it was what he listened to and he made all those great changes. And most of our interaction was a lot of play-based motor movement types of activities, but not specifically those activities that were, those exercises that are online. Um, I think they're great exercises to do. They really target a lot of different areas, but if your child lacks the imitation skills, necessary to do them. You can modify them, you can vary them, you can choose your own exercises. So there's really a lot of flexibility around um, this part of the program. So now for those of you who want a bit more technical information, I'm going to just kind of talk um, pretty quickly about um, the ear. So um, this is kind of where sound three is working. We have three parts of the ear and your, the sound three program is really working the whole auditory system. So from the dynamic filter that creates um, this gymnastics of the middle ear muscles. So we're working the middle ear. Uh, plus we have the bone conduction that goes directly to the inner ear, which is the cochlea and the semicircular canals. So you're working, um, you know, the movement piece, the vestibule, uh, semicircular canals, sorry, and the um, classical pieces that are in the program target more of the cochlear part of the ear. So your whole ear and auditory system is really getting a workout, which is why we see um, changes in not only motor um, and coordination and movement and things like that, but also in the area of speech and language. Um, so just as a reminder, you know, the, the vestibular system is so important, you know, as we develop, it's how we learn to roll roll over, sit up, crawl, move to sit, you know, from sit to standing, um, how we then develop other skills using both sides of our body together at first, and then having one side do one thing while the other is doing something else, such as writing, you're using one hand to hold your paper, the other to write along the paper, along the page. Um, and it also helps control the muscles of our eyes. Uh, kids on the spectrum can have difficulty using their visual systems to scan their environment and can become over, um, overly visual focused or have difficulty kind of knowing what's around them from a visual perspective. Um, and I've seen that change too, as children have been working with the program that their eye contact, they're a little bit more tuned in, their um, world, which used to be down here and focused just in whatever was in front of them starts to open up. They start to tune into others around them. Um, and it's um, just touching upon here, just the importance of this vestibular system. And that's really where, um, Sound three is focused. It's really a movement and music program. Um, so this was a lot of information and I'm sure I went a little bit fast, so apologies. Um, let's get into some of the, the pricing. So I'm not sure where everybody's coming from, but in the US it's about $299, um, 279 euros if you're in Europe. Um, you can find tons of information on the website, sound3.com. Um, there's a great you know, two week money back guarantee. The product is guaranteed for two years. Um, and there is um, research online that you can look up. Um, this program was developed out of the Tomatis method. So we have lots of studies on that. Um, this program came out in the summer of 2018. So we have lots of great um, case studies. We have a lot of research um, studies that are currently in the works. Um, a lot of therapists are currently using it and giving great feedback. Um, my, me, I personally used it myself and had great um, success with a variety of different um, children, adults, um, individuals using the program. So I'm going to see if anybody has any questions. Mom, I think you can just type them and just hit um, reply to all panelists. So if anybody has questions, I'll try and answer them. And if not, I will definitely get back to you on the information. I don't see, hopefully I'm looking at the right space. Let me check question and answer. I don't see any questions yet. I'm gonna just move on to our contact information. I think, um, I think I've been, the most important thing is that um, you're, the child children you're working with, oh, there's a, Sorry, the question is, how many children have you tried these and how do you think are responders? Um, so I've tried them in my practice with um, personally just seven kids um, that tried it, um, various ages from five. Um, I worked with a, an adult who was 31 who had um, a brain injury um, and he made great um, results in regards to his motor skills. He had a lot of cerebellum 
um, area that was impacted. So his rhythm for holding um, coordination skills and things like that um, was really great. Um, and I've had a variety of different, different kids that have worked with the program, some with a diagnosis, some without a diagnosis, some with a genetic disorder. So I've had um, a lot of different kids that have used it. So I hope that was and how do I think they're responders? My experience, they've been great responders. Um, I had one girl that had a genetic disorder, so um, her overall profile and system was a little bit more defensive. So what we did was we did two weeks of the program and then she took about the weekend off and then mom started back up with the program. Um, and then mom was really great. So anytime she noticed that she just seemed to need a little bit of a break, she would give a break and then just go back to the next day in the program. Um, another question is how long does the child listen to music per day and how many days? So the full program is 40 days and that's about, um, and I can um, have Caroline, my colleagues, send all this information. Um, each day is probably 28 minutes if you include the three, two to three minutes of the exercise track. Um, but um, Cammy, my little example that I've been using today, um, he only did the first part of the program. So that was about 25, um, 26 minutes per day, depending on the day. And then I have had kids, just for uh, your information, that have started the program, done the first 40 days of the program. Then they took about a month, month and a half break. And then they did um, a different variation where they did um, two weeks. So right now I have a, a young man, he's 18. He has Down syndrome with some autistic-like tendency was his diagnosis. And he'll do every six weeks, he'll do about a two-week boost just to keep his auditory system working. Um, if they don't use it them every day. So that's one, I think the more consistently you use the program, the, the better you're going to see change in results, but it's okay if they skip a day here or there. The little girl that I talked about, she did two weeks. She took a, the weekend off and then got back to right where she was in the program. Um, the young man that I was working with, he was 31. He came in Monday through Thursday. Then he had something going on over the weekend and then he couldn't come in on Monday. So he took a few days off and then started back up. Um, with the program. So it's okay if they skip a day here or there. Um, do we need to do a few sessions or only one with 28 sessions? I think you need to do at least a, at least 30 days to really see change um, and change that's going to stay and going to hold. Um, and I think it's going to, you're going to work with whoever you are um, or not work with, but you're depending on your child and their profile and what's happening, um, will modify that. So maybe it's, um, you set up a routine where it's Monday through Friday and the weekends are off. Or maybe the weekends are easier, there's more flexibility, so the weekends are part of your weekly um, routine of listening. And just another, oops, sorry, maybe, let me scroll down and see if I'm missing questions, sorry. So sounds reverse forebrain is another question. Um, so there are two different devices. Um, forebrain is an audio vocal tool that I have right here that uses, um, uses a microphone. So there's no music involved in the forebrain. So it's totally different program, um, but I use both programs together. I think they're a, a very nice pairing, especially if you have um, children that are more sensitive to auditory input, I might start them on the sensory program and then introduce Forebrain um, after they've done maybe a week or two of the listening. Um, the next question, Tomatis has a long history. Is this device new? Is it related to Tomatis but can't replace it? So this program was developed um, out of the Tomatis method um, by uh, experienced Tomatis consultants that created this program. So there are um, similarities, the, the gating, the dynamic filter, um, it's not to replace Tomatis. Um, I think it's a really great introduction to auditory um, and the Tomatis method. Um, I think it's um, the Tomatis method can be anywhere from like an hour of listening per day, 40 minutes to an hour and a half. So it's a little bit more intensive. So for some of those children that um, that's just too much for them, this is a nice introduction to that. Um, with the Tomatis method, depending on what level of practitioner you are, there's so many more um, parameters that you can change and modifications. You can do active work within it. So um, Soundtree really is a different tool um, compared to the Tomatis method. And this method just um, was released in 2018. Um, 
and sounds very similar to normal Tomata sessions. I think that kind of answered that. Um, it's similar in the sense that he has gating, it has delays in it, um, but it is a set program. There's no changes that can be made to the program. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to read all the questions. So there's a question about if the kid could, could not use the phone meaning touching the phone. I'm not sure if I totally understand the question. Or maybe you mean because they're sensitive to the headsets. Um, I have had kids that are sensitive to the headsets and um, having anything in here, um, but I've worked with um, listening for how many years now? 15 years. And I really haven't had any child that hasn't accepted it. The first day or two can be really challenging in that you have, you're trying to keep the headsets on. You're trying to have another person, if that's an option, use distracting, reinforcing, motivating toy, uh, toys, tools, activities. Um, but by the second day, they're usually off and, and running and accepting the headsets. You're not going to feel necessarily feel the bone conduction if you raise the volume pretty high then you'll be able to feel it a little bit more um, but to make sure that it's actually working you're going to put um, your ear on the headset with it playing and you'll be able to hear the music so you'll put kind of close the air conduction piece like this and just put um, put your ear up to the top Sorry, it just takes me a second to scroll down. So this would probably be a question for Caroline, but my understanding is there's products that are made um, in different countries that are then shipped, but I'm not 100% on that. Um, so I will um, get back to everybody on that question and it's definitely repairable if you um, have any issues with it, but I haven't had knock on wood any issues and I'm using swings and kids climbing and dropping the headsets in the sessions. So it's a very durable um, headset. Do you prefer to do a few sessions of sounds read, like in Tomatis or only one? Um, it depends on each, um, each situation, each kid. Um, I think more is better. So for example, I have um, my 18 year old uh, Down syndrome, nonverbal, um, did not get a lot of, my personal opinion, a lot of appropriate intervention, had no communication advice, nothing. So he is doing sensory a lot more frequently, a lot more often. You know, his family bought, purchased the equipment. So like I mentioned earlier, he does every, about every six weeks, he'll do like a two week boost. Um, but he did do about two rounds of the full program. Um, and now actually the mom just sent me a message that um, since everybody is locked in, routines are all different, that they're actually doing it every day and he's been loving it. And he's another child that um, does not do the exercises. He just doesn't have the imitation skills to copy those, um, to copy the movements. But he's moving so much more, it's incredible. Um, the question is for an adult, is forebrain preferred? I think it's gonna really be um, a, a question of what you're trying to work on with the adult. Um, I don't see a problem. I've used the program myself with Soundsory. Um, I have had just other therapists that have said that sometimes the adults or, or teenagers that use the program don't like the kid song. There's no, pe there's no people singing, but it's you know, the rhythm of you know, Twinkle Twinkle, so you can just fast forward that song. Um, I think if they're using Forebrain, it's for you know, audio vocal work, so communication and things like that. So they're two different tools. Um, that are you. So I think it's really going to depend on the adult that you have in front of you and what they're trying to work on. So I always like to allow, um, the question is how long of a pause between sounds and sessions. I like to give at least a month in between because the program is intensive, a month to two weeks depending. Um, and you'll start to, to get a sense once the, your child is going through the, through, through the program kind of where he's changing, when he needs a break, when he doesn't need a break, so that it will help you determine like, okay, this was a lot. He needs, you know, at least a month break, maybe two months break. Uh, but I would say at least a minimum of a month break you want to give the individual that you're working with or your child. And 
And again, it's really easy to use. Everything is in the headsets. It's really easy to, to check everything, check the volume, takes no time at all. Um, I'm trying to think what else. You can pair them up to your phone, to your computer, and listen to your own music on that, which is also nice. So you have a really nice set of headsets. Um, any other questions or things that I didn't cover? And I will have, oh, and I think um, if it wasn't stated earlier, I believe there is a discount um, that Caroline is my colleague that she's based out of Hong Kong will um, email along with the presentation slides and all the information about that. Plus she will tell you where the, the product is actually built in and manufactured. So I'll wait maybe a couple more minutes if any, yep, another question. Sorry, I gotta scroll down. I keep forgetting to do that. Would it be more efficient to listen to lessons together for adults? Um, so meaning you do like day one and day two all on day one. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to depend on the adult you're working with. Um, I think you could run the risk of maybe fatigue, fatiguing their auditory system, or maybe running the risk of just being overwhelmed, overstimulated by the auditory information. Um, I haven't personally tried that, um, but with anything, I would try it on myself first to see what I experienced, what that felt like for listening to two sessions together um, before I would then try it on an adult. But I think it would be a little bit um, easier to try an adult than a young, younger child who maybe has more sensitivities depending on, although your adult could have also a lot of sensitivities as well. Other last minute questions? Again, you can always reach out to us. Um, I'm happy to answer any technical questions or, or therapy questions if you start to work with the program and um, run into any questions as you're going through the program. So any other questions? Gonna wait. If not, you have all our contact information, and I know Caroline will send you guys um, out an email with the slides, the discount, um, and you will have her contact information if you have any other questions or anything like that as well as mine. So if that's all, I think we'll sign off for today. Yep, I don't see any more. With dis, um, a last question, how does Soundsory help with dyslexia? Well, a lot of, oftentimes um, people with dyslexia have also motor issues, so difficulties with left, right, confusion around that. Um, so if you're improving that vestibule, the vestibule part of the ear, you know, being able to better automatically identify left, right, things like that, to be better able to use your auditory muscles to really perceive the different sounds, I would imagine that that would alleviate um, some of the dyslexia and make things easier for the child or individual who has um, dyslexia. Do you have any video evidence of children that have used the program? Um, I have a little girl that has used the program. I don't think they have organized the videos yet. Um, I have uh, videos of the young man that I talked about who we will be posting. I think that it's just a matter of organizing them from day one to day um, 40. So, um, so yes, there are, they're just not up yet. And I will check to, with Caroline also just to make sure I'm not miss speaking. Any other questions? Yes, sorry, scrolling down again. And I, somebody is asking to have contact with me. Yes, absolutely. So I will 
hold on. Let me see if I can do this. Put my email. Let's see if this works. Sorry. Hopefully you all see that. Did that come through? Oops, sorry, let me just scroll down again. Oops, nope, it didn't come through. Okay, let me just try to do this. Let's see if this works, sorry. Hopefully that worked. Sorry, and then there, let me scroll. Nope, it did not work. I do not know why it's not working. Um, so my email address, if you wanna take this down is, um, oops, sorry, I have a question. I did it on chat. I don't know if everybody saw it, but anyway, my email is um, K and then a period, and then it's my last name, T-A-V-O-L-A-C-C-I and that's at tomatis.com. And I think I messaged it on the Zoom webinar chat, so hopefully that came through. But either way, um, I will have Caroline, when she sends the email tomorrow, um, include all my contact information if anybody wants to reach out to me and ask uh, more therapy questions or anything like that. I'm happy to, to chat. All right, let me just scroll down. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks everybody for taking the time to listen to the talk. Um, we are gonna be repeating this talk on Thursday if you know anybody that wants to listen to it or if you wanna follow it again. Um, it's gonna be the same thing, so that might be a little redundant. Um, but anyway, have a great evening, afternoon, enjoy the rest of your day. Oops, let me just see if that's a question before we go. Yes, nope, not a question. You're welcome, and it was great to um, have this opportunity with you. So look out for the email from Caroline, and we will be in touch. Okay, bye everybody.